And so we are uh, in a um, sermon series called Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And this is the, the fifth uh, in, our, in our series. And we've uh, loosely been following uh, Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray. And we've been uh, working through this acronym, P-R-A-Y, P for pause, R for rejoice, A for ask, and Y for yield. Uh, Vivian spoke about pausing to recenter our priorities on God. And then the next week, Robert spoke about rejoicing, and he spoke about how the psalmist would regularly describe God to himself. That when we speak about God's magnificent name, it builds our faith and it focuses our prayers on him. And then last week, Neil did the first talk on asking God. And perhaps his key point was just ask. Just ask, based on James chapter 4, verse 2, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So just ask. So today I'm giving the second talk on asking God, but with a, a rather different focus. We're going to be thinking about intercessory prayer today. So I'm going to start by just thinking about what intercessory prayer is. Then I'll explain why I chose to speak on the subject of intercessory prayer. Um, then we'll have a look at some intercessory prayers from the Bible and what they might teach us about making such prayers. And then finally, we'll think about uh, a bit about intercessory prayer today. So what is intercessory prayer? Well, the word intercessory is obviously linked with intercession and intercede. It's the act of intervening on behalf of someone else. At its simplest, intercessory prayer is praying for others. Praying for others. In 1 Timothy, Paul urges us to pray for all people, to ask God to help them, to intercede on their behalf. And in Ephesians, Paul encourages us to never stop praying, especially for others. To pray for others is to love them. And Max Licardo, an American pastor and author, says that we are never more like Jesus than when we pray for others. So intercessory prayers. Intercessory prayers, they could be prayers for healing or forgiveness. They could be prayers for God to favor someone or bless someone or a group of people. They could be prayers for the church with a small C or prayers for the church with a large C. They could be prayers for our town or our region or our country or even the whole world. So that's some of the content of intercessory prayers. We've been using this, as well as the PRAY acronym, P-R-A-Y, we've also been using the Lord's Prayer as something of a guide for our series. And so this morning I want us to just focus on three, three little words from the Lord's Prayer, from that's prayer, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Three little words, but what a massive prayer that is. When we pray your kingdom come, we're asking God to bring healing to our world, to our broken world. Everything in our news tells us that the world is broken. And yet the good thing is that we know that God has promised to restore our broken world, that one day, one day there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, that one day God's kingdom will come. And so we cry out in prayer, Heavenly Father, your kingdom come, your kingdom come. In Matthew chapter 6, after telling his disciples not to worry about everyday life, Jesus tells them to seek the kingdom of God above all else. And so I think our prayer for God's kingdom to come is reflects God's top priority, and so it should certainly be one of ours as well. So, intercessory prayer is asking God to step in where things are broken and to put them right. It's praying for others. It's pleading to God on behalf of others. So why did I choose to speak on this topic today? I had a free reign as to which of the, uh, which of the subjects to uh, speak about, and uh, I chose this because it's the one that I feel most passionately about. Let me tell you about my, my very first prayers, at least the very first prayers that I can remember. Uh, for, I never, never used to pray before I was a Christian because how could I? I didn't believe that God 
even existed, so how could I pray? But then just a, a few days, about it was, uh, three or four days before I became a Christian, before I made my commitment to follow Jesus, uh, it was a, a Sunday in the church that I was in then, and there were three open prayer sessions. And uh, I resisted praying in the, in the first two of those prayer sessions, but when the, the prayer, prayer openings, as it were, but on the third one, I just couldn't help myself. My heart was just beating so much, I couldn't help speaking out loud this prayer. And it was just, yeah, just the Holy Spirit speaking, you know, and yeah, my prayer basically was, you know, for, for a broken world, for this world in which everything's gone wrong because people have rejected God. That's the cause of everything going wrong. And so my prayer was basically that God would heal that, that God would bring about his kingdom. Yeah, so that was my very first, my very first prayer. A few, days, a few days later, I made my commitment to follow Jesus on the, the Thursday after that Sunday. And then the very next morning, in the, in the very early hours of Friday morning, I'm not quite sure what time it was, but that time between sort of sleeping and waking, I just started to pray, and I prayed for everyone and everything. I couldn't, uh, I didn't, didn't really know, I uh, wasn't really praying myself, it was just so much the Holy Spirit praying through me, I think. Those prayers probably lasted for something like two hours that morning. I, you know, by the time I got up, I was drenched in sweat. I was just yeah, couldn't stop myself, uh, couldn't stop myself praying that morning. And uh, so that was my, you know, my first experiences of prayer. I had a great first few days as a, as a Christian, having made my commitment to follow Jesus. I was full of joy, full of love, seeing things I'd not seen before, sharing my testimony with others but then on the the Monday after that Thursday God brought me back down to earth with a bit of a bump and he said basically he I woke up I think it was six o'clock sharp in the morning and I got this message to read the book of Amos I'm not sure I'd even heard of Amos at the time but uh, anyway got up read the book of Amos and got the message that God was giving me was very much that he hates prayer and worship if it's not also concerned with uh, uh, if you're not also concerned about justice and righteousness. I mean, I, I love, uh, love worshipping and praising as much as anyone else. We've had a great time of praise and worship this morning, but God doesn't just want praise and worship. God also wants us to be concerned about our world, to have a concern for justice and you know, the healing of our world. There's this wonderful image in Amos chapter 5 of the of, this, of God saying that he wants to see a flood of, a mighty flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living. Again, it sounds a bit to me like your kingdom come, your kingdom come, Lord. But unfortunately, as we look around, it's not God's kingdom that we see in our world today. And so that breaks God's heart. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. There's something quite incredible about intercessory prayer, I must admit. I don't really understand it. I don't really understand the way in which God works. Why does God want our prayers to transform the world? Why doesn't he just do it himself? Why doesn't God intervene more to bring about his kingdom in this world? Why, is it, why does it feel as though his kingdom has advanced not so much in the last 2,000 years. So why does God want us to be involved in, in those prayers? I came across these words written in the 17th century by Blaise Pascal, who's a French philosopher and Catholic theologian, and I thought they were rather appropriate. He says, God instituted prayer to bestow upon his creatures the dignity of causality. God instituted prayer to bestow upon his creatures the dignity of causality. Now that's, a, that's rather a mouthful, isn't it? But the next one is perhaps a little easier. Prayer, prayer is the power by which we participate with God in changing the world. The power by which we participate with God in changing the world. So God wants us to give our prayers to help 
and changing the world. So that's amazing. So intercessory prayer is the one, the area of prayer that I feel most passionately about. Let's, let's turn now to think about examples of intercessory prayer in the Bible. I don't know, who do you, who do you think of when you think of intercessors or intercessory prayers in the Bible? first person that springs to my mind is, is Abraham. Abraham and the incident about Sodom and Gomorrah. God reveals to Abraham his plans to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the wickedness that he finds there. But Abraham challenges God and he says, will you sweep it away if you find 50 righteous people living there? And he goes on, 45, 40, 30, 20, 10, Will you sweep it away? And God, of course, says, no, he won't sweep it away if he finds 10 righteous people living there. Abraham's challenge to God is based upon his belief that surely the judge of all the earth will do what is right. In God's kingdom, there will be justice for all. God is the judge of all the earth and he will do what is right. The second person I think of is Moses. Moses interceded at least a couple of times for the people. Firstly, following the incident of the golden calf, when God threatened to destroy them all, Moses intervened. Moses reminded God of the promises that he had made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Moses pointed out that if God destroyed the Israelites, what would the Egyptians think? What would the Egyptians think if, Mo if God destroyed the Israelites having rescued them from Egypt? And Moses uses that same argument again when the people rebelled in the wilderness and God threatened to destroy them with a plague. Moses pleaded with God to prove his great power by showing that he's slow to anger and filled with unfailing love not to demonstrate his power by destroying them all, but to demonstrate his power of forgiveness, forgiveness for every kind of sin and rebellion. So Moses pleaded on behalf of the people. The third example from the Old Testament that I wanted to take was uh, Daniel. When Daniel discovers that uh, Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years, he pleads with God in prayer and fasting. And Daniel says, for your own sake, God, do not delay. For your sake, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. He goes on to say, we make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your great mercy. And then the angel Gabriel appears to Daniel. And he says that when Daniel started to pray, a command was given by God in heaven. Wouldn't it be great if God sent an angel to us to tell us when we started to pray that God was listening and he was sending a command. So that's a few examples from the Old Testament. I could, of course, have come up with, uh, with many more. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, Paul, in every re virtually every letter that Paul writes, Paul prays for the people that he's writing to. Just to take an example from Ephesians 3, Paul says, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you. I pray that Christ will make his home in your hearts. I pray that you may understand how long, how wide, how long, how high and how deep the love of God is. Now all glory to God, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish more than we, infinitely more than we might ask or imagine. Glory to him in the church and glory to him in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. So that's a few examples from the Bible and Jesus is himself, of course, our great intercessor seated at the right hand of God, pleading for people, interceding on behalf of people. But what can we learn from these biblical examples of intercessory prayer? 
I've gone a little off piste here and I've used uh, this book, You Can Pray by Tim Chester, so rather than uh, Pete Craig's book. Um, but in that book, he has, in the final section, it's uh, what, we can, what We Pray, and he has a chapter called The Arguments of Prayer. The Arguments of Prayer. Tim Chester says that when we make intercessory prayers, we shouldn't just come along with a shopping list of, of requests, but instead we plead with God, and we even argue with him, backing that up with reasons for our requests. Tim refers to three main arguments that we can use in our prayers. And I think each of these arguments is backed up by those prayers that we've looked at in the, uh, in the Bible. So firstly, we pray in such a way that in answering our prayers that God may be glorified. Secondly, we pray, we seek God's mercy in our prayers. And thirdly, we can remind God of any promises that he's made that would be fulfilled in answering our prayers. Let's consider each of those three arguments a little bit more. The glory of God, the glory of God. Very early in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray, hallowed be your name, hallowed be your name. We want God's name to be glorified. And we now conclude the Lord's Prayer with the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. So the glory of God. The prayer that we looked at from Paul in Ephesians finishes with that wonderful climax. All glory to God. Glory to God in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations. Abraham said, surely the judge of all the earth will do what is right. We give glory to God because he is the great judge of all the earth. And Moses said, what will the Egyptians think? What will the Egyptians think if God wipes out all the Israelites having, having rescued them? The Egyptians are in awe of God because of the way in which he had rescued the Hebrew slaves. But if God then goes on to wipe them out, the Egyptians are no longer going to give God the glory, are they? So in any situation that we're praying for, we can ask ourselves, how can God be glorified or honored in this situation? How can God's goodness and greatness be made known or be made clear in this situation. So we, we pray for God's reputation. We pray that his name will be honored. We pray that he will be glorified. We pray your kingdom come. The second argument we can make is uh, stems from God's unfailing love. Forgive us our sins, forgive us our sins. Abraham pleads for God's mercy on the righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Moses said God needs to prove his power by showing that he's filled with unfailing love to forgive every kind of sin and rebellion. Daniel said we make this plea not because we deserve help but because of God's mercy. We cannot solve the problems of the world ourselves, so we remind God of his great love and mercy for this world as a reason for answering our prayers. We acknowledge our weaknesses and we throw ourselves on the mercy of God. So that's the second argument that Tim Chester refers to. And then the third one is promises of God. We can make arguments to God about what he has said in his word, the Bible. What has he promised? Moses reminded God of his, promises to, of his promise to bless the Israelites with their own land. Your will be done. Your will be done. Praying according to the will of God is finding out from the Bible what God has promised and praying for that. When we don't know what to pray for, the Holy Spirit helps us to plead in harmony with God's will. So what has God promised? in the Bible. We can pray based on the promises of God. Walter Wink, a well-known theologian, says that intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. Spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. We say, God, this is not the way things should be. 
step in and intervene to bring about your kingdom, that your will may be done here on earth. And so intercessory prayer is praying for others. It's pleading with God. It's making arguments with God. I particularly looked this morning at such prayers as they relate to those words from the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. We've looked at some intercessory prayers in the Bible and what they might teach us about the arguments that we might make to God in such prayers. But let's think, let's turn now to think about intercessory prayers today, intercessory prayers. <clears throat> About four months or so ago, Neil was um, doing a sermon series on the presence of God and uh, following a, a small group session discussing that, I decided to start using the Lectio 365 daily prayer app. I don't know how many of you have come across that or, or used it. But I, uh, anyway, I started, started using that for my prayers each morning and for about six weeks in particular, I used it and really was praying off the back of those each morning. I'm still, still reading them each morning, but I must admit I don't pray quite to the same extent that I did in those first six weeks or so. But that, uh, that prayer app, that was produced by uh, the 24-7 prayer movement, which uh, Pete Gregg was uh, one, of the, one of the founders of and uh, yeah we've been looking at uh, Pete Gregg's book How to Pray in this series I wonder how many of you have come across or have heard of Count Zinzendorf anyone come across him I must admit I hadn't hadn't heard of him until a couple of months ago uh, but then I, I came across him in Pete Gregg's book and then he also came up on the uh, the, the daily prayer app as well. There was two weeks uh, about this uh, community that was, uh, that, that was founded, that he founded. Uh, in Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray, Count Zinzendorf is described of the, as the hero of intercession. Why is, the he, why is he the hero of intercession? Well, he was instrumental in setting up the first 24-7 prayer initiative. A band of Moravian refugees had uh, established a community called Hernhut on Zinzendorf's land near Dresden. And those refugees, they started quarreling. And when they started quarreling, Zinzendorf called them together. He brought them all together and he said, you need to apologize to one another. And when they did so, when they apologized to one another, the Holy Spirit was poured out in an incredible way on them. And two weeks later, 24 men and 24 women were inspired to covenant together to pray continuously for one hour each throughout the day and night. And that 24-7 prayer initiative lasted for over 100 years. It's incredible, isn't it? 100 years of 24-7 prayer that started then. The current 24-7 prayer initiative has now been going for about 25 years, but the inspiration for that was that previous prayer initiative that that Moravian community started in the 1700s. So it'd be a bit remiss of me if I didn't say something about uh, what Pete Gregg said about intercessory prayer in his, uh, in, his, in his book. And he gives us three simple steps to grow in intercession. First of all, to get informed, to find out some relevant facts, find out the facts before you. You can pray better about things if you know the facts about a situation. Secondly, to get inspired, to engage with God's word. Has God given any promises that are relevant to the situation that you're praying about? What outcomes will glorify God? What is God's will for it? What are the possibilities? So get inspired, engage with God's word. And thirdly, get indignant. Get indignant, engage with your heart. Engage with your heart, make arguments for why God should do something about the situation that you're praying about. Wrestle with it. Wrestle with God if necessary. Use those arguments that Tim Chester talked about. The glory of God, the mercy of God, and the promises of God. So finally, I just want to conclude by bringing the subject of intercessory prayer 
a bit closer to home with an example uh, from within the fellowship. Each Monday morning between 10 and 11, a group of us have been gathering together to pray for peace. Prayer for peace. We generally meet at Peter Slater's house, but as uh, Neil said, we, tomorrow we will be meeting at uh, Jenny's house because Peter's got visitors. We've been praying together for over two and a half years now since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. There are times when our prayers together just feel like a, a real struggle. We don't know what to pray for in those situations and so we, we groan with the Holy Spirit and we turn the situations over to God for him to act in his great mercy and wisdom. But at other times we can sense that God is working within us in our prayers and we can spark off each other. It's great when we get together and pray. As I was uh, bringing Jenny home uh, from, from the prayers last Monday, uh, she shared how it had been a real privilege to partner with God in prayer that morning. And that is what we're doing. That is what we've been doing each Monday, partnering with God in prayer. As Blaise Pascal said over 300 years ago, prayer is the power by which we participate with God in changing the world. So we partner with God. Let us persevere in praying. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. That's my, that's my challenge to us all this coming week. That every day this week, just pray those three little words. Your kingdom come. Use those words to inspire your prayers. Where in the world do we need to see God's kingdom break through? For what issues do we need to practice that spiritual defiance that Walter Wink talked about? What's standing in the way of what God has promised? What broken situations need healing? Who do you know who needs Jesus in their life? So let's pray those, those three little words together each day this coming week.